Jasmine, it's yours. All right. Um, thanks everybody for, for joining us. We're really excited to have David Lubensky from New Michigan uh, telling us about his his living history. And and with that, I'm just gonna pass it on to him so he he can have as much of this time as possible. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I, I hope that I will have something to say that is actually of interest to some of you. Um, so I wanted to, um, to start this out by saying that in many ways, you know, my career trajectory has been very conventional. Um, if you sort of go down my CV and look at the things you should check off, you know, I went to the, the right and put schools and worked with the right people. Um, and in thinking about what was the best use of 10 minutes here, I sort of thought I would not emphasize that. Um, and so instead, what I'm going to try to emphasize here is the part that's maybe a slightly less conventional, which is, so I'm a physicist, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I do what we would now call theoretical physics of living systems. Um, and so what, what I'm going to talk about, try, try to focus on today is how did I end up there? And the closely related question of, you know, what are theoretical physicists good for anyway? Because, um, that, I mean, it. this is not as burning a question now as it was when, when I chose to move towards biological things, but I think it is still an important question. And it was one that I spent a lot of time wondering about and wrestling with when I was trying to decide, you know, what, what direction my, my career was going to take. And I see that I had not started timing. So sorry, I looked at my watch to make sure I had a time. Um, okay. So, so with that said, the downside of that is that the rest of this is going to not put a lot of emphasis on the human side of things. And that's not because the human side is not important. Of course, it is exceptionally important. Um, and so to be sure that I don't forget it and don't rush through it, I wanted to start by thanking the people who influenced me in my scientific development. And especially, especially those um, in bold, who served as uh, as formal advisors or mentors. So Ray Goldstein for, as an undergrad, Jean-François Joanny when I spent a gap year abroad, my thesis advisor, David Nelson, and my postdoc advisors, Boris Schreiman and Fred McIntosh. Um, and you know, they have influenced me in countless ways, some of which I'm sure I don't even realize. Um, and I'm not going to enumerate most of them here, but I want to say a thank you before I get on to other things. Um, okay, so with that in mind, how did I end up as a physicist and you know, the most vicious form of physicist, a theoretical physicist, wanting to do things in biology? Um, so if you had asked me in middle school or high school what I wanted to do with my life, the most likely answer would have been archaeology. So I was very lucky that when I was a kid, my family was able to travel some. So this is me at some Roman ruins in the south of France. Um, and with my sister, and, um, and and I was absolutely fascinated by ruined cities, and it seemed like the coolest thing ever. Um, and so I, you know, as I got older, I started looking into um, archaeology. There was a professor in my high school, uh, Mr. McCarter, who had a professor. I say professor, I'm so used to being in a college. I, we didn't call them professors. We called them teachers, of course, in high school. Uh, who who was very interested in archaeology, and we were near, the high school was near an important revolutionary war site, Valley Forge, and he used to take a group of students to go dig there every summer, and so I did that one summer, and, um, and, and I had a real revelation, which was that I find the subject matter and the, um, the questions of archaeology fascinating, and I still find it fascinating, and still read about it all the time, and still you know, first thing I do is um, when I go to a new city is go to a museum. Um, but I, I'm not cut out for actually doing it because, um, because it is a field where it is very, very hard to actually know things. And, and the definition of what it is to know something and the way that academic knowledge is constructed is, is too fuzzy for me. Um, and, and so with that in mind, I started moving more towards uh, physical sciences and I got to college 
and like probably many people watching this, I took um, I took introductory ENM and I took introductory ENM using Purcell. And Purcell is of course an absolutely beautiful book, um, and and just filled with with the the elegance and the simplicity um, and the ability to you know that uh, to answer big um, big questions with powerful ideas that we all love about physics. And and I took that course and I fell in love with it and I said okay I'm going to do physics. Um, and so I, I went on the conventional physics path, um, and um, and along the way, I did undergraduate research. And the other thing I realized was that I like physics, but I particularly like physics with things you can see. And so um, in grad school, I started, I sort of happened into biologically inspired physics. So my thesis title was Theoretical Studies of Polynucleotide Biophysics which were a lot of words that most physicists didn't know in those days. And it was essentially polymer physics done with DNA. Um, and, and I liked it because polymers are, are concrete things you can draw pictures of for yourself. Um, but what one thing that did was that started exposing me to biology. And so I was in grad school in the 90s and you couldn't pick up a newspaper without seeing something about the Human Genome Project and genomes getting sequenced. And you know, biology was was changing fast and drastically. And in particular, there was a feeling that that biology was was changing from a field with no data to a field with, oh my gosh, we have all this data. What do we do with it? You know, we don't know how to do data. And um, so so there's everyone was saying, oh, we need more scientists in biology. And you know, I had sort of seen enough of it from worrying about DNA sequencing and polymers and pores to um, to want to learn learn more about it. And so I spent a lot of time in grad school. I took the intro undergrad biology class. I went to endless, endless, endless seminars. Um, and I was very lucky to be a graduate fellow at the KITP at um, a KITP program on statistical physics and biology organized by Terry Wah, which was sort of the in many ways, I think this, the starting gun for physicists really moving into this part of biology. Um, and it was incredibly intense, but but had, you know, the, I, I think the videos of those talks are still valuable for the way they brought in um, prominent biologists to try to explain to physicists what it is that biology is actually about. Um, okay, so, so I reached the end of grad school thinking um, biology was interesting. My advisor was pushing me pretty hard to get into biology because it seemed like the, the new big thing. But I also had this nagging feeling that, you know, I'm a theoretical physicist and, and you know, I love Purcell and, and this is things like this is what brings me joy in science. What am I going to do in biology? And the most conventional answer at that time was bioinformatics. And so this is, this is a beautiful, brilliant paper and very influential paper by Eric Sidja. Um, on how to find um, sequence regulatory sequence motifs in the yeast genome um, by building a dictionary. And um, it was lots of fun because the first they tried to find words in the text of the novel Moby Dick, then they used the same, um, the same techniques to try to find uh, transcription factor binding sites in the yeast genome. Um, and, and this is what it was really clear that there was to do. Right. I mean, this was obviously important and obviously useful and obviously required quantitative skills that most bench biologists at that time didn't have. Um, but but I also sort of found it profoundly unsatisfying, like e even though I recognize it was important and you know, it's wonderful that that there are people who do this and biology wouldn't function without it. I sort of felt like it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and so I spent a lot of time agonizing about this and um, anybody who's watching this who knows me will know that I'm very good at agonizing about big decisions. So, um, so, um, and, and trying to figure out whether I wanted to really make the jump in biology or whether I wanted to do a postdoc in something that looked more like physics. Um, and somewhat, you know, more or less by ha happenstance, during my period of agonizing, um, I went to a talk by Stan Leiber. And um, he was talking about this paper, which had actually, I didn't know about it, but it had come out a couple of years earlier about robustness in biochemical networks. And this is a very famous paper that many of you may know about. But what, what you may not recognize is 
the influence it had at that time in demonstrating almost for the first time that it was possible to get something that looked like elegant theory out of the, the incredible mess that appears to be present in cells. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it wasn't obvious to us back in the 90s that, that you could just be a physicist and build models of cells and it would be useful because there's so much stuff in there you don't know about or you don't really understand. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't quite clear what you were supposed to do. Um, and, and seeing this talk was such a relief to me because it made me think, okay, there are things that I can do that I will find beautiful and intellectually satisfying that will also address the undeniably big, interesting questions in biology. Um, and, you know, that, I mean, this paper was brilliant in a way that nothing I've done since cer certainly was anywhere close to, but um, I, I, this was a real inspiration to me. And, and I think it's um, important to recognize the way that sort of random things you come across can, can change the direction of your career. Um, okay, so with that in mind, I went to do a postdoc um, with Boris Schremann and really focused on trying to come up with good questions and simple answers to those questions. Um, I worked a lot on pattern formation in fly eyes. We drew these sorts of network diagrams, tried to simplify them. And one of my proudest accomplishments still is that we were able to predict that the normal pattern in fly eyes with isolated cells can sometimes turn into a pattern of stripes when you have the correct mutant. Um, and okay, and, and so this was sort of the first step in trying to, to tease out what can you do that looks like model building or, or being a theorist in biology. Um, from that, I went on, I actually did a second postdoc and started the collaboration that, that has sustained me for a lot of my time also as a PI. Um, and as a PI, I've sort of had a bifurcated set of interests. One is um, one one topic is circadian clocks and cyanobacteria, going back to this paper and this is a long you know collaboration with Peter Einstein Volda that's been I think eighteen years now. Um, and the other interest has been developmental biology, particularly collaborating with Pamela Raymond at the University of Michigan, but also with other people. Um, and what I think is interesting about this in terms of the question of what does it mean to be a, a what what good or a theorists in biology, is that for circadian clocks, both the nature of the data and the sociology of the field is such that you can publish papers that are nothing but theory in a model, and it can be meaningful and people will look at it, and it can actually drive experiments. Whereas for both scientific and sociological reasons, that's much, much harder to get away with in developmental biology. And so when I do development, we spend a lot of time, you know, segmenting images and trying to find, you know, defects in the uh, in the chromosaic array and things like this. Um, so I think um, I, I will close them by saying that, you know, I'm still struggling to try to figure out exactly what a theorist is supposed to do in biology. And of course, it's the answer is changing because biology is changing. But I have come to a few conclusions, and, and I hesitate to call these lessons for everyone, but let's call them at least things that I find important for myself. So one is that collaborators are incredibly important, and I haven't I, emphasized this so much. A, just a, a, quick, a quick note that uh, we're running a little over time. Yeah, so the last slide, uh, you know, lessons. So collaborators are incredibly important, especially in the interdisciplinary field. The other thing that I think is very important to me is to do things that bring me joy in the day to day. When I have gone wrong, it's usually been because I've been too focused on like what's going to end up in science or what is going to get me a big grant and not enough on what I am excited about doing every day. Um, take the biology seriously. And, and I always try to think about whether a given project is supposed to be good biology or good physics or maybe good both, but at least good one or the other. I, I think that, you know, where, where we mess up is often to get confused about what the point, whether the point is to explain biology or the point is to get clean physics. Um, and finally, listen to everything, go to talks, read everything, and particularly early in your career. So I still draw on biology seminars I went to 20 years ago because 
you know, I just don't have time to do that much anymore. But but having that breadth and the understanding of what's out there is incredibly important. Okay, I will uh, conclude with that. Great, thank you so much. Um, given given time constraints, I'll take one question that was sent to me in in the chat. Um, is there a non-theoretical physicist side of you that you you want to want to share with us? And and I can kind of hone in on on one thing in particular. You mentioned you know your your early interest in archaeology and and why you know that was a little too too fuzzy to kind of really hold your uh, interest as a as a profession. And it's it's interesting then that you kind of ended up in studying the area of science, which which is the most messy and the most complex and then yeah, the most and, fuzzy, and, really. I mean, this is precisely why I brought it up, is that that there there's a tension between things with big unanswered questions and things that are too messy. And, you know, I think I've been endlessly worrying about how you resolve that tension and find something that is both, you know, a really appealing question and a question that has an answer. Or that we, where we are capable of coming up with answers. Right. Um, yeah. So, so I'm still very interested in archaeology. I'm still interested in art history. I had a, you know, I, I had moments in college when I flirted with becoming an art historian, and I didn't for roughly the same reasons that I love learning about it, but I don't love the process of constructing new knowledge and academic research in it because it, you know, it's not, it's the, the you're you're not sure enough you're right when you're done. As a matter of fact, many people would say there's no such thing as being right in a field like that. Um, yeah, I let me. I'm, I'm babbling on. Let me. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, it's all, all all incredibly interesting.